Hello, thank you all for inviting me today to this wonderful symposium. I'd like to speak today about Yules Johnson's correlation, correlation solved. My name is Philip Ernst. I'm an associate professor in the Department of Statistics at Rice University. And Yules Johnson's correlation solved um, is my joint paper with uh, Larry Shep, deceased, and Abraham Weiner, U Penn, uh, recently published in the Annals of Statistics in 2017. So Yule Johnson's correlation solved uh, starts with Udney Yule. And Udney Yule was a British statistician uh, who made many advances in empirical statistics. And in his obituary, the British statistician Frank Yates wrote that Yule took the first steps in many directions, which were later to prove fruitful lines for further progress. He can indeed rightly claim to be one of the pioneers of modern statistics. Well, of the many papers that he wrote, there was one 1926 paper about nonsense correlation that we're going to be speaking about today. And the excerpt that's relevant to our talk today comes from uh, the 1960, 1926 paper in the Journal of the Royal Statistical Society. And it says the following. We sometimes obtain between quantities varying with time, quite high correlations, by this he meant the Pearson correlation, to which we cannot attach any physical significance whatever. Although under the ordinary test, meaning the t-test, the correlation would be held to be certainly significant. The occurrence of such nonsense correlations makes one mistrust the serious arguments that are sometimes put forward on the basis of correlations between time series. Okay, so that's a lot to process, so I want to distill what Yule is trying to say uh, into two simple bullet points. Yule is speaking about two distinct but often confused phenomena. The first is spurious correlation. That's correlation observed when two time series are themselves dependent upon an observed, an unobserved third time series. Um, and this has been widely tackled by econometricians. But nonsense correlation is when you have correlation observed between two independent time series without any regard whatsoever to an underlying third time series. And that's the subject of our story today. And the simplest example is I have two IID random walks simulated by uh, coins. I have no reason to think that there's a third time series happening in the background. So the formal mathematical setup of Yule-Stanson's correlation begins with the definition of empirical correlation. So if we're to consider two sequences of ID random variables, X and Y, let's assume they have finite variances. Let S and be the partial sum of the first sequence, and T and be the partial sum of the second sequence. The statistic we'd like to consider is theta N1, so N is the sample size. I put one as a superscript because we'll have another statistic. And it's written as you would expect the empirical correlation to be. I have the sum of SIPI minus 1 over N, the sum of I equals 1 to N, SI, the sum of TJ. This is a covariance. And then I have the standard deviations for each part. And this is a bona fide definition of empirical correlation. And what surprised Yule in 1926 was that there was something going on there that he couldn't quite understand, um, or that seemed very odd. And what he did is that he had uh, two coins. He flipped them each 10 times, modeled as two ID random walks independent of each other. So he used this formula and let n equal 10 kept track of SI and TI, the partial sums, and then reproduced data in one 600 times and drew this histogram. And in this histogram, M is the mean, it's zero, so that we expect. On average, if I start with two ID random walks independent of each other, the mean should be zero. But what's more surprising is that the standard deviation of this distribution is so high. It's 0.5. And we would hope that after 600 sample sizes, the variance would have shrunk much more, but it doesn't. And 
you wanted not only an empirical explanation, but more importantly, a full mathematical proof that the analytic, uh, that if I computed the, the, the moments of this distribution, the second moment uh, would indeed uh, be around 0.25, the standard deviation squared. And so, just so that no one in the audience might think that this was an artifact of sample size. In R, we can immediately do this again, of course, calculating theta n1 instead of n being uh, 10, let n be 10,000, and then repeat this 10,000 times, and we create this histogram. And again, it's very concerning. Uh, the probability of seeing a correlation of zero is uh, seems almost as high or as high as observing 0.5 or negative 0.5, which of course is extremely concerning when you start off with two IAB random walks independent of each other. And more importantly, um, before we go to any analytical proofs, we can do a Monte Carlo iteration of the first 10 moments of theta. And theta is an odd function, so the, uh, so uh, so theta is a symmetric function, so the odd moments will, of course, be zero. And, of course, they are here. Uh, the first moment is right near zero. There are quadratures. The third moment is right near zero, and so on. But what's important in this picture is the second moment. And if I take the square root of the second moment, I get somewhere close to 0.5. And that's the issue. So what's wrong with this all? So I've, I've definitely said, um, the first thing that I've said is actually number two here, that the chances of observing a value of 0.5, an absolute value, are extremely high. And this should not happen for truly independent data. The second thing is that the observed correlation coefficient has a very different distribution than the nominal t distribution. So if I look at this distribution, it appears uniform uh, roughly uniform from negative 0.5 to 0.5, it is definitely asymptotically not a normal distribution. And finally, the middle 95% of the observed correlation coefficients fall in this interval from negative 0.83 to positive 0.83. And of course, that's ridiculous because if we start off with two IAB random walks independent of each other, we would hope that not only an average that we would see zero, but it would be bound in a very tight interval asymptotically, or some interval that at least decays to zero. And we don't have that, and that's very concerning. Now, on an applied level, why does this matter? Well, the empirical correlation of two IB random walks suffers from not having an asymptotically nominal t distribution. And so if we were to use it as a proxy for correlation and write the t statistic to be r, or theta n1, root n minus 2 times over the square root of 1 minus theta n1 squared, which is a standard formula uh, for measuring the significance of correlation uh, for a nominal t distribution, uh, we would get something completely meaningless. Um, so for example, if you had theta n1 to be 0.5, uh, calculated from two IB random walks, and n equal 149, you'd get a t statistic of 7, and you'd incorrectly reject the null hypothesis of independence, even though you started off knowing that I have two IB random walks independent of each other. And this error was uh, mentioned quite eloquently by McShane and Weiner in their 2011 paper in the Annals of Applied Statistics. And the reason that McShane and Weiner, or one of the reasons that McShane and Weiner wrote this paper was to critique efforts of reconstructing the Earth's temperature using correlated time series. So this field of paleoclimatology uh, in which this is active, um, there are many things to say about this field, and I won't be saying anything about it today, but the one thing I will say is that if you do have climate variables that can be modeled using IAB random walks, this is definitely not the right statistics to use. So in terms of the understanding of yules Johnson's correlation, although it was empirically understood quite well um, after Yule, um, it did remain isolated from the literature, according to the statistical science paper from Aldrich. Uh, key 
victories in understanding spurious correlation uh, were made by PCB Phillips in 1986 and also his 1998 econometrical paper. But an exact calculation of the moments of this distribution remained open. And that will be the point of this talk. But I've, before I go into the analytics, I want to go back to the statistics itself. So I said that I had theta n1, but I would have theta n2. And what theta n2 here is the following. Instead of writing the partial sums, I write the random variables xi and yi. And if I have theta n2 here, it's easy to see that when x and y are independent, theta n2 converges to zero almost surely by the law of large numbers. And the question that you might ask is, well, why don't I use theta n2? Why am I using theta n1? Why well, have the phenomena of Euler's nonsense correlation? And the answer is that, well, in time series, we have time dependence. And this would only be useful if we had no time dependence. So in reality, everything that you would write in S1 would be Xi plus some epsilon. Um, and uh, it would be uh, useless for a time series or with temporal dependence uh, to use theta n2. Okay, so one of the other things that I should say is that the structure of theta n1 does show why we have this concept of nonsense correlation or volatility in correlation. Volatility meaning that the distribution is heavily dispersed and frequently large in absolute value. And the word volatility uh, is credited to Ed George from the University of Pennsylvania. And the reason we have the volatility is that the partial sums are highly dependent. So if you have a random walk, the increments are independent, but the partial sums are highly dependent. And so you're taking a statistic of two things that are highly dependent. Okay. Um, so we begin our investigation by saying, let's look at theta n1 and see what we can do with theta n1 in terms of calculating the moments. But unfortunately, there's not much we can do. And really smart people have worked on it. Erdos and Katz have a paper in 1946 that deals with calculations very similar to the calculations that one would try to do for writing the moments of theta n1. But there's a hint that Phillips in 1986 gives us. He writes in his paper that theta n1 converges weakly to theta. And that isn't hard to see. Um, the sums become the integrals. The integrals are from 0 to 1 because of the self-similarity of the Wiener process. And the partial sums become the Wiener process, W1, W2, where W1 and W2 are assumed to be independent. And so instead of working forward with theta n1, we're going to be working with theta. Theta is the asymptotic analog of theta n1. And it doesn't rely upon partial sums. But that doesn't mean that it doesn't have volatile correlation. In fact, there is volatile correlation still because each Wiener process is self-correlated in time. And that's because it's an integral of pure noise, and thus its values at different time points are correlated. But unlike theta n1, theta is going to be much more easy to analyze due to the very nice properties of Brownian motion and Friedholm determinants. OK, so I'd like to give a short line of proof of how we're going to accomplish the result of getting the moments of theta, or getting the second moment in our case. We're going to start by rewriting theta in a form that involves stochastic integrals. We'll use this function f, uh, which is well suited to calculate the moments of theta. So we'll be introducing a function f. It won't be the moment generating function of theta but it will be a moment generating function of certain form, quadratic, a moment generating function of certain uh, quadratic uh, Gaussian random variables. In this process, we'll be computing Laplace transforms of the trivariate object of the three quadratic bilinear forms of W. There are three quadratic uh, forms. One is the numerator and two from the denominator. 
And eventually, we'll be able to obtain an explicit double integral expression for the variance as follows. Unfortunately, we won't be able to, to give um, explicit formulas for high order moments. But we will be able to do it for the variance, which does solve the 90-year-old problem. OK, so the first thing that we might want to look at when we start working with theta is the following. Does theta make sense as empirical correlation? We've shown that theta and 1 here converges in law, or Phillips has shown that it converges in law to theta. But does theta represent empirical correlation in the way that I think it should? And the answer is yes. Simply, I can let mi be the integral from 0 to 1 of w i t p t. And I can rewrite theta in terms of it. And equation 2 makes it very easy to now understand that theta must be bounded between negative 1 and 1 by Cauchy-Schwarz. I have the inner product here and the norm of each. And therefore, theta is bounded by negative 1 and 1. Now, in doing the work, it is useful to look at the previous literature, of course. And notice that we have three quadratic forms with square roots. The closest thing that we could find in the literature was a ratio of quadratic forms of Gaussian random variables, but just two, ratio, but just two quadratic uh, forms. The first proposition of the paper um, is that theta, which is written in terms of this time integral, can actually be written as a stochastic integral, where the numerator and the, each of the terms in the denominator are given by equation 4, which says that xij is written as this double stochastic integral with a coefficient of min s1s2 minus s1s2. And so the question is, why is this true? Why is it true that we can simply substitute x12, x11, and x22 given by this formula and get exactly theta? Well, we'll see that it's a lucky guess, um, but there is something deeper going on. And what is deeper going on is this coefficient, min s1, s2 minus s1, s2. So let me ask, why would we want the, war the term min s1, s2 minus s1, s2? So, right, it's a covariance of pinned Brownian motion, or the pinned Wiener process in 0 to 1. Um, and we'll see that the Brownian bridge will play a role in these arguments. So, we are starting with a guess, which has a covariance structure of the pinned Brownian motion. And in order to prove that this guess is correct, we have to start with 4, work backwards, using equalities, and show that we finally get theta. And if we do, the proof is done. So fortunately, we can do that. We start off with our guess for xij, just taking out the coefficient, min s1, s2, minus s1, s2. <clears throat> we apply the fundamental theorem of calculus. We have these three integrals and then these four integrals. The first part is easy to calculate. The second part isn't. Um, the region uh, is not so easy to work with. The region from where S1 goes from 0 to 1, S2 goes from 0 to 1, S goes from 0 to S1, T goes from 0 to S2. And so we'd like to use the old tool of integrating over equivalent regions. And so we're going to do that by finding an equivalent region. And the equivalent region is that S1 will go from S to 1, S2 will go from T to 1, S will go from 0 to 1, and T will go from 0 to 1. And after we do that, the right-hand side of this last display becomes this. We arrange the terms. Straightforward algebra shows us that xij can now be written exactly as this form. And this is exactly the form of x12, x11, and x22 given by theta. And so that completes the proof. Um, so that result is very nice. This guess, right, of this double stochastic integral shows that we can rewrite theta, which is an integral with respect to time, in terms of this stochastic integral. Any questions? Okay, some comments. 
Um, the first comment is that, as I've said, we've recognized the appearance of a Brownian bridge when converting theta to a ratio of stochastic integrals. One thing that we'll have to keep in mind for the Brownian bridge is that it does have a Cronoloed decomposition with eigenvalues that can be computed as 1 over pi squared n squared. And that's actually pretty special because often in Cronoloed expansion theory, it's hard to calculate the eigenvalues explicitly. Uh, this is just a short review of what corona law of expansions are for writing Gaussian processes um, as these uh, infinite sums. And what will also be very nice is that we'll be able to show that the freedom determinant we need is a product of 1 minus alpha n to the negative 1 half. And if we can compute the alpha n, then that will go a long way in helping. Okay, so the second part of the proof is to look at this function f. That isn't the moment generating function of theta, but should be well suited to calculating the moments of theta. And we're going to take it for what it is as a moment, 6. It says taken three constants, theta 1, beta 2, a, and write it as the expected value of the exponential of a beta 1 beta 2 x 1 2 minus beta 1 squared over 2 x 1 1 minus beta 2 squared over 2 x 2 2. And also note that this is only true, we're defining, we're defining f as such only for a specific range. And the range is that the absolute value of a is bounded by 1 and beta i is greater than or equal to 0 for both i equal to 1 and 2. And under this construction, well, we know that x12 can be written as follows. And we also know that by Cauchy-Schwartz, uh, the absolute value of theta is bounded by 1. So the exponent here will be bounded by 0, which means the expectand will be bounded by unity. And so for the range that we care about here, this f, beta 1, beta 2a, will be bounded by 1 doesn't necessarily have to be bounded by 1. We just needed it to be finite. And indeed, it is finite. But in other ranges that we don't need to consider here, it does, it, it is equal to infinity. So that is fortunate. But that doesn't show yet that f will be useful. But what does show that f will be useful is the key theorem of the paper. And the key theorem of the paper says that I can write f beta 1 beta 2 a as 1 over the hyperbolic sine of c plus over c plus times the hyperbolic sine of c minus over c minus, where c plus and c minus are given in terms of beta 1, beta 2a as follows. And this expression in 8 is quite unexpected. Because if you look back at f in 6, beta 1, beta 2a, it's a moment generating function of certain quadratic forms of Gaussian random variables. It's a relatively complex expression. But the theorem says that we can actually simplify it to something that's relatively quite simple, um, an expression in terms of the hyperbolic sign only. And that's really important because if f is to be used to generate the moments of theta, we would like f to be as simple as possible in order for us to be working analytically. So let's prove this theorem. It's a key theorem of the paper, and I think the most beautiful result of the paper. And we'll start proving this theorem by just recalling uh, what x i j are. x i j, uh, x 1 2, x 1 1, x 2 2 are now defining theta. Um, so theta is given by x 1 2 over the square root of x 1 1 x times the square root of x 2 2. And recall that we have this function m which is a covariance of pin Brownian motion, which is the minimum of S1, S2 minus S1, S2. Well, we're now going to define a kernel function. And it will be given by this matrix. And the diagonal elements of the matrix will be given by negative beta i squared times the covariance of pin Brownian motion. And the off diagonal elements will be given by A beta 1 beta 2 times the covariance of pin Brownian motion. And there are two important things here to notice. The first thing is that 
all of the elements of k are going to be scalar multiples of each other. That will come into play later. The second thing to notice is that this, of course, is Taylor designed to our function f. Um, the off-diagonal elements have the term eta, beta 1, beta 2. The diagonal elements have this beta i squared. And that's exactly what we have here. The off-diagonal element x12 has the same beta 1, beta 2. And the diagonal elements have this negative beta i squared. They just don't have over 2, but this division by 2 is for computational convenience. Okay, so now that we've defined uh, K, the kernel matrix, in terms of M, the covariance of pin Brownian motion, we'd like to look at the linear transformations given rise to by M and by K. So let's start with the easier one, which is M. It gives rise to a linear transformation, TM, from L201 to L201, where it takes in an element G in L201. We're using the inner product, the standard inner product on L201. And for reasons that will be, become evident later for orthonormal basis purposes and standard tools and functional analysis, one needs to check that TM is self-adjoint, positive, definite, and continuous um, linear transformation. And indeed it is, and it's straightforward to check that. So that is the definition of TM. Now we need to think about the linear transformation given rise to by TK. Um, just a little bit more, more complicated, but nothing too hard. Let's let M2 by 2 be the universe of 2 by 2 matrices with entries in L2, 0, 1 times 0, 1. And let's consider G, which is, an L, uh, which is one of the M2 by 2 matrices, to be a linear transformation from L2, 0, 1 squared to L2, 0, 1 squared given by 14, where it takes in the vector g, which is in L201 squared. And so it's straightforward to check again uh, that tk is self-adjoint, positive, definite, and a continuous linear transformation. And also, to be clear, we're using the standard inner product, meaning that if f and s, f and g uh, as vectors are elements of L201 squared, their inner product is a standard inner product. Uh, and, and all that we need to do is, since G was just a random element of M2 by 2, so is K. And therefore, this is a linear transformation given rise to by K. So now that we have M and K and TM and TK introduced, that sets the stage for proving the theorem. And the proof of the theorem is going to have two parts. We're going to first show that f can be expressed as a determinant, the freedom determinant, of i minus tk, where tk is, again, the linear transformation given rise to by k. And secondly, we're going to be able to compute this determinant by calculating the eigenvalues of tk. Right? We alluded to that earlier when we spoke about um, the coronal of expansion. Uh, but this is going to become quite clear in the sequel. And so to begin with, Let's just recall what f beta 1, beta 2a is. It's exactly this. And k encodes all the information about x1, 2, x1, 1, and x2, 2. So the first proposition just says, I can rewrite this top line by this proposition. Um, and there's nothing going on here other than basic arithmetic. Um, it just says that I'm using k here. And it's a nice way to just consolidate these terms. But now the question is, what do we do when we have k? And before we think about this, we've already shown that tk is self-adjoint and positive definite and a continuous linear transformation. But because it is as such, there exists a countable orthonormal basis of L201 squared consisting of eigenvectors Vn for tk. And as a matter of notation, we're going to let the eigenvectors of tk be phi n and alpha n to be the corresponding eigenvalues of tk. Now we're ready to deal with k. So 
we want to look at this k term here, we have tk, we have the eigenvectors phi n of tk and alpha n to be the corresponding eigenvalues. Um, we know that it gives rise to an orthonormal basis. And equation 18 says that I can decompose k as the sum, the infinite sum, of the eigenvalues alpha n times the eigenvector uh, phi n i1 s1 times phi n i2 s2. And this is simply true by Mercer's theorem, which, which says that you can represent k by a series in the complete set of orthonormal eigenfunctions. Um, and so there will be no need to prove this, um, but this is really an excellent way of moving forwards because we had this k here in 17, and now we have a nice way to actually work with k in terms of the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of tk. So now going forwards, what we would do is that we would take k here and we'd plug it into this part here and see what we get. And what we get is 20. And What's special about 20 is that it can be further decomposed into, just by algebraic manipulation, 1 over the square root of the product of 1 minus alpha n. And therefore, the proposition that we have, um, which is just a proof by algebra here, is that I can write f beta 1 beta 2a as 1 over the square root of the determinant of i minus tk, which ends up being 1 over the square root of the product of 1 minus alpha n. Okay, so that puts us in a good position because if we would like to write f beta 1 beta 2a in a simpler form, we now have everything we need. We have 1 over the square root of the product of 1 minus alpha n. And the question is, can we calculate this explicitly? Well, let's go back to tk. So the entries in K are all scalar multiples of each other by construction. All of them were scalar multiples of the covariance of pin browning in motion. So we're going to guess that the eigenvectors of TK are of separable form. And then we want to ask, well, what would the eigenvectors and eigenvalues of TM look like, the simpler object? And a good guess, right, just working from Fourier theory is that let psi n t to be the root of uh, square root of the root of 2 sine pi n t for n greater than or equal to 1 and t in 0, 1. That forms an orthonormal basis of L2, 0, 1 consisting of eigenvectors for Tm. And once I have that as my guess for my eigenvectors that form an orthonormal eigenbasis, uh, orthonormal basis uh, of L2, 0, 1. I can immediately compute the corresponding eigenvalues, and that is 1 over pi squared n squared. And that should ring a bell, because in the beginning of the talk, we said this going over of expansion is related to the Brownian bridge with eigenvalues 1 over pi squared n squared. And that's exactly what we have here. So Tm was the linear transformation given rise to by the Brownian bridge, and it has corresponding eigenvalues 1 over pi squared n squared. But what we really care about are the eigenvalues of tk. Because if we go back here, recall that alpha n are the eigenvalues of tk, and we want to be able to calculate them. And in order to do that, we need to have some relationship between the eigenvalues of tm and the eigenvalues of tk. So tm is given rise, the linear transformation given rise to by the covariance of pin Brownian in motion. It has eigenvalues lambda n. And this proposition says for every lambda n, there are two eigenvalues, gamma n plus or minus of tk, where gamma n plus or minus are written in terms of the eigenvalues of tm times this structure. And this structure isn't surprising given that the theorem, when I have that f is equal to 1 over the cinch of c plus c minus, all of these C pluses and C minuses are given by this. And so one can prove this 
um, proposition um, with just some high level algebra. Uh, but what's more important is that we're looking at the eigenvectors, uh, we're looking at the eigenvalues uh, alpha n, and you can show, again, easily, that the set alpha n is the same as the set gamma n plus or minus. The next proposition is really critical because it solves the complete problem that we care about. Again, just to go back, we care about finding this, one over the square root of the product of one minus alpha n. But in order to do that, we have to calculate the product of one minus alpha n. And this proposition says we can do it in a way that we would have probably never expected. It's equal to the hyperbolic sine of c plus over c plus times hyperbolic sine of c minus over c minus, where c plus and minus were defined earlier um, in equation 16 originally. And that's really surprising. What is the intuition for any of this? So before we get to the intuition, let's just look at what we're calculating. So we're calculating the product of 1 minus alpha n. Um, that's equal to the product of 1 minus gamma n plus 1 minus gamma n minus, right? Those are the, um, those are the eigenvalues for Tk. And then we have that the eigenvalues for Tk can be written in terms of the eigenvalues for Tm. The eigenvalues for Tm were in terms of 1 over pi squared n squared, right? So we're going back to this proposition that allows us to write the eigenvalues of Tk in terms of the eigenvalues for Tm. And so we can now write this as a product of 1 minus z plus squared over pi squared n squared times the product of 1 minus z minus squared over pi squared n squared. But how do we go from there to the hyperbolic sign? And here's the beauty of the proof. The beauty of the proof is that we use this identity that we've known about since the 1700s, but Boaz is a nice reference for it. The identity says that if z is a real number, sine z over z is a product from n equals 1 to infinity of 1 minus z squared over pi squared n squared. That's magical. And if I have a complex number z, well, I can easily write it in terms of the hyperbolic sign. And so sine z over z, this product of 1 minus z squared over pi squared n squared, is exactly what we have here. And so amazingly, we can write this product as sine z plus over z plus sine z minus over z minus. And that completes the proof. Because now z is a complex uh, is a complex number, it becomes a hyperbolic sign. We were looking at one over the square root of this, and uh, that's now done because we have exactly that in the claim, one over the square root of this. So that's pretty magical that we can actually get such a simple form for f. F starts with an uh, moment generating function of certain quadratic forms of Gaussian random variables and through freedom determinants and this amazing identity about sine z over z, we can rewrite it as something rather simple. One over the hyperbolic sine c plus c plus times hyperbolic sine of c minus over c minus. Any questions? Okay, so one thing that I want to say before I go on to the next part of the proof is that recall that f had um, the absolute value of a to be bounded by 1 and beta i squared to be greater than or equal to 0. If that didn't happen, it would diverge. And so it is very fortunate and lucky that we found this f that has a range that we needed for the problem and that also gives us such a, such, such a simple form um, as 1 over the hyperbolic sine c plus c plus hyperbolic sine c minus c minus and square root. 
Okay, well, the next part of the talk um, asks the following question. So now I have F, it's a moment generating function of certain quadratic forms of Gaussian random variables. And I'd like to use F to get the moments of theta, as I would expect. It's a notation that I'm going to need. So I'm going to let F prime to be the partial derivative with respect to the third object, Z, of F beta 1 beta 2 Z. And the goal of all the work in this section of the paper is to prove that this power series, where I'm going to have to isolate e theta to the 2n can be written as follows, where I only have the derivative with respect to the third argument of f. Now, of course, I should have f there because it's a moment generating function of certain quadratic forms. But as we'll see in a second, it's really nice that it simplifies to something so easy. And I'd like to give some intuition for this. So, we would like to start off by looking at the right-hand side. We're going to leave the left-hand side road alone. We're going to look at the right-hand side. And we have this term z times this derivative with respect to the third argument. And we'll call that v, v, v bar. And we'll rewrite v bar in terms of f. And notice that I've written four terms here, f beta 1 beta 2a minus f uh, the square root of, lamb, uh, uh, of gamma 1 beta 1 beta 2 a over lambda, uh, square root of lambda 1. And it turns out that this combination of f is such that each term converges. And each term will in turn be helpful to solving the problem. Um, and so that's magical that in some way that we're able to write v prime, uh, v bar, in terms of um, a series of f where each term actually converges. Um, in order to, under, to appreciate the final theorem, I just want to go to an intermediate theorem. So set, again, we left the left side alone. But in order to finally get the right side to be something so simple, z times, after these double integrals, z times the derivative of f with respect to the third object, we see here in this mid proposition, which is used in term to prove the theorem, how complicated matters are. Right? We have the second derivative here, we have all these terms. Um, but we can work from this proposition in the end, um, and this is again only high level algebra, to show that indeed we have equation 36. Well, now that we have equation 36, this really opens the doors towards solving the 90 year old problem because. We can first try to rewrite this in a simple form and then match uh, coefficients of z for the power series. And so that's exactly what we're going to do. And when we do that, we're going to get the following. So we're going to match the coefficients uh, for the power series for z. Uh, there is some algebra that will happen, of course. But we're going to collect terms with k equal n minus 1. And we're going to eventually get equation 53, which says that the even moments can be written in terms of the right-hand side. But there are two functions here that we need, s, which is the square root of u over the hyperbolic sine of u, and t, which is a logarithmic derivative of s. And now, if I plug it 1 in, I get r minus 1 choose n minus 1, r minus 1 choose 0, which is 1, that's great. This binomial coefficient vanishes. But if n is 2 or more, the binomial coefficient remains there. If n is 2, I have r minus 1 choose uh, 1, which is r minus 1. And actually, we can't go forward to higher order moments with this. But we can get the second moment. And indeed, let's focus on that for now. So let's let n equal 1 in this expression and calculate the double integral. And using exactly the definitions of s and t, we find that the double integral expression is given as follows. And although we can't calculate this by hand, we can use numerics without 
straight numerics without any simulation, any Monte Carlo, so purely analytical answer, to get the precise second moment. And the second moment that we get from this is 0.240532. And I think there are two merits to this. I think the first merit is sort of obvious in the sense that we've been able to close this problem, this 90-year-old problem, by calculating the second moment of the empirical distribution of the, of, of the empirical correlation of two IAB random walks independent of each other or the continuous time analog. Um, but also we've solved something that should, we hope, help the climate science debate written about uh, by McShane and Weiner. Monte Carlo originally gave us that the second moment should be around 0.235. Not entirely accurate, of course, as we expect due to the quadratures. But I think in general, when we're approaching any scientific problem in either climate science or any other area, it's nice to have an analytical benchmark about what the truth really is. Uh, and this gives us certainty that the second moment of this distribution is exactly this. Now, there are many future extensions to this work. The first is, how do you develop a method so that you don't have this problem of the binomial coefficient. And you're able to actually write all the moments implicitly, uh, explicitly, and therefore write the density of theta. Um, because of course, in theory, right, if you have the moments, you're on compact support, you choose a basis, a Legendre basis, or any other basis that you want, and you can write the density in terms of that basis in the moments. Uh, so that would be very nice. Um, but also, we'd like to look at analytical forms for the empirical correlation of other Gaussian processes, such as correlated Brownian motions, ornstein ohlenbeck processes, um, Brownian bridges. Uh, and we'd like to compare the variances of the correlation coefficients among these cases. OK, so I'm almost out of time. Uh, so I just want to say one more thing which is that, where does this lead us? So this problem shows us what not to do. If we have two random walks, we should not be using the empirical correlation to test independence. But the question is, what should we be using instead? Now, if you have ID data, like you do for these random walks, you could count increments. And that would be completely fine. But in the real world, we often don't have ID data. So what statistical test for two pairs of passive stochastic processes that are highly non-stationary, like the random walk, would be appropriate? Certainly not the current test that we have now. Of course, for stationary processes, this is less of, a, less of an issue because um, you can write a central limit theorem that shows that, for example, if I have two ornstein ohlenbeck processes, uh, that if I take the empirical correlation uh, and I scale it by time, um, that I do have a limiting random variable that's Gaussian with mean zero and with variance that uh, decays according to the mean reversion rate. And as the mean reversion rate uh, increases, it goes to zero. So the purpose of this work would really be for non-stationary processes. Um, and that, we think, is a really important thing. So I'm going to conclude just with a summary of the references. So Aldrich is a reference about the history of the problem. Uh, the second reference Boaz here is where you'll find the nice sine z over z formula, or in many other places. The Erdos and Katz paper um, does some of the calculations about the original theta n1. Uh, this is our paper. Uh, this paper is helpful by Logan and Shep in, uh, once we have F, trying to use it to get E theta to the 2n. Magnus had the work on quadratic forms of Gaussian random variables um, in ratios. McShane and Weiner have uh, the practical implications of the misuse of Yule's nonsense correlation. Peter Phillips' paper in 1986 uh, writes that theta n1 in discrete time converges in law 
to theta, which is what we start with. We have uh, the integral of the two Wiener processes. And finally, it all starts in essence with the last reference. Why do we sometimes get nonsense correlations between time series, a studying sampling in the nature of time series by a new